Okay, uh, let me introduce our first speaker, who is uh, Professor Cynthia Amanin. Uh, she will be taking us uh, in the first part of the workshop. We uh, also have our second speaker, who is uh, Faith Sablon. She will also be taking us in the next uh, part of the session. And uh, I just would like to request uh, Professor uh, Cynthia to begin with. And uh, to introduce uh, Professor Cynthia Amaning, he's a professor in the Department of Pharmacology, Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, College of Health Sciences, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. She obtained her PhD from the School of Pharmacy, University College London, United Kingdom. Her Master of Philosophy, Pharmacology and BFARM degrees were obtained from the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Kumasi, Ghana, and she, hold, she holds a certificate in pharmacovigilance from the University of Groningen in Netherlands. She's a registered pharmacist and a member of the Pharmaceutical Society of Ghana. Her advanced level and ordinary level certificates were obtained from Wesley Girls High School and Akosombo International School, respectively. She's proud ISOSAN. Her research interest spans across natural product drug discovery to tackle antimicrobial resistance, particularly in tuberculosis, infectious diseases, pharmacology, and toxicology of natural products and antimicrobial resistance. A stewardship, sorry. Professor Cynthia Dangwa is a recipient of the African Oxford Research Development Award, the NAST Research Fund, interdisciplinary and seed grants, an affiliate of the African Academy of Sciences, country ambassador for the American Society for Microbiology and a member of the British Pharmacology, Pharmacological Society. She is a reviewer for several in academic journals and has participated in several international conferences and workshops across the globe. To mark International Women's Day in 2022, the Ministry of Women, Gender and Social Protection awarded her a recognition of her outstanding contribution to the social and economic development of Ghana in the category of tertiary education and scientific research at the seven Women of Excellence Awards. Cynthia, and I hope I'm allowed to mention this. Uh, okay, she's married to Dr. Daniel Amaning Dangwa, a pharmacist, and they have three sons. Thank you so much. You can see that I have a highly accomplished scientist and a professional in the house. And uh, without make, taking uh, much time, I wish to invite her to the workshop. Welcome, Professor. Thank you very much, Jimmy, and thanks for the um, nice compliments. Hello to everybody online. And uh, you are welcome to this presentation. Uh, as you rightly told, my research interest is in antimicrobial resistance, but I work in the area of drug discovery, um, natural product drug discovery to tackle antimicrobial resistance, especially in tuberculosis. But as you are all aware, there are so many advances in uh, antimicrobial research and development. And uh, one of those advances include precision antimicrobials. And so I would like to say that even though um, this is quite advanced and I'm not working in the area of precision antimicrobials, I think it would be good that we all have an overview or an introduction to understand um, where the world is heading to. As you know, in the advanced countries now, they are heading or have started using pharmacogenomics in therapy as in individualization of care. Um, they will study the genetics of every of the individual and then determine which drugs will best work in their case. But you know, some of these things uh, are still new to us in our part of the world. And so when it comes to research and development also, a lot is going on. And so we just want to have an overview or a peep into what the precision antimicrobials uh, is all about or what is the rationale uh, behind these new discoveries. So basically 
this is uh, an introduction to precision antimicrobials. As we are all aware of the problem of antimicrobial resistance, the WHO has described um, AMR as the greatest health challenge affecting uh, both rich and, and, and poor. And until COVID-19 came in, and as you know, as for COVID, it took us by surprise. But antimicrobial resistance is the looming pandemic on our head that we are aware of and uh, we are trying to fight I think that we all need to do more to help tackle the challenge head on uh, because resistance is on the rise. And uh, for diseases like TB, we can talk about multi-drug resistance and extensively drug resistance, as well as even totally drug resistant strains of mycobacterium in some parts of the world. So basically resistance is on the rise but when you look at the antibiotic uh, pipeline over the past three decades or more, there has been a steady decline when you look at the graph that we have. Consistently, there has been a decline in the number of new antibiotics that gets to the patient's bedside. So it means that the antibiotic pipeline is running dry. On the other hand, resistance is on the rise. And so if we are not careful, then we are going to go back to the post-antibiotic era. We pray that we don't reach there then. It will mean that there'll be no medications or effective antibiotics for surgery, cesarean sections, wounds, diabetic wounds, and all kinds of respiratory tract infections, urinary tract infections. Uh, we all don't want to um, get to that point. And that is why uh, the WHO has recommended using the One Health approach to tackle AMR. So this is more of um, a collaborative and a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary approach between involving human health, veterinary medicine, environmental science, agricultural science, because we all uh, work uh, in a way. So when we put all our efforts together, then we can tackle the AMR menace because it is such a complex uh, uh, situation and therefore different approaches, as um, you rightly said, are being used. So apart from AMR or uh, antimicrobial stewardship, uh, we can talk about infection prevention control, and then we'll talk about the development uh, of new and effective agents. So that is the drug discovery um, area. Sorry, that's the drug discovery area. And then we also have to uh, do more rapid diagnostics. If the test, ideally, you know that we should do antimicrobial susceptibility test uh, before a particular antibiotic is prescribed, we should do the diagnosis to be sure of the pathogens causing a particular infection before the antibiotic is prescribed. But that is not what happens in most of our health facilities. And so that is also one approach that needs working on. And then now we can talk about the novel strategies to make um, the use of these existing drugs more precise. So uh, if we are talking about making the drugs more precise, then it means that, well, we have some drugs already, uh, but how are they working? What is the problem? And why should we make them more precise? And so we need to establish what the problem is. What is the problem? We have antibiotics, yes. Um, we have broad spectrum antibiotics. But the problem is that we are abusing uh, most of our antibiotics. There's irrational use of the antibiotics. There is over prescription of antibiotics in some parts or in developed countries without a prescription, you can never get an antibiotic. But when you come to most parts of Africa, 
you would even find people in the marketplaces having uh, antibiotics in poly bags and others, selling in buses and others. You can go to the pharmacy and it's likely that sometimes you may get antibiotics without prescription. People are self-medicating, we are underdosing or overdosing. And so, so many super bugs uh, have now developed, which are not responding to the antibiotics. So these are, are broad spectrum antibiotics. Because they are broad spectrum, will kill all sensitive bacteria. And because of selective pressure, some of them will acquire resistance and not be killed or, or respond to the, to the antibiotic. Others, because of um, after exposure, which doesn't kill them, they can mutate. And so these mutated ones, uh, those that are resistant and others are all adding to the diversity of the intestinal microbiota. We have a lot of resistant uh, pathogens in there um, that are not responding. And the broad spectrum antibiotics are equally killing both the good and the bad bacteria, which all make up the microbiota or the flora and fauna of the gut. So, I mean, the whole thing is, is very challenging. In addition to this, the broad spectrum antibiotics, as you said, are going to disturb the intestinal um, microbiota. And there have several studies that have shown that uh, there's disruption of the, of the gut, of the microbiota in the gut. And meanwhile, these, uh, the good bacteria in there have various roles that they play that make them very useful to us. And so if we disrupt it, if we kill them, then that imbalance uh, will harm us or the balance, the, cinema, the, the role that it plays will not be able to play that role. And that can also uh, cause other problems to us. Because if the intestinal microbiota is balanced, it helps in proper absorption of nutrients in the body, it helps in homeostasis and proper metabolism in the body. It helps to maintain the intestinal motility, even in digestion, etc. And then all the other bacteria uh, also have a way of preventing other invasive pathogenic bacteria or other opportunistic bacteria from coming to occupy the gut because they may be secreting or producing some bacteriocin, some organic acids and hydrogen peroxide that may ward off other opportunistic or pathogenic bacteria. So without these restrictions, then there is a disruption or what we call dysbiosis in the gut. And this will lead to diseases or conditions such as pseudomembranous colitis and other dysbacteriosis um, occurring. So then we need to find uh, agents. We need to find novel or we need to innovate therapeutic um, strategies that would uh, target or precisely target the pathogenic bacteria. So um, as you are aware, we have broad spectrum antimicrobials, and then we also have narrow spectrum antibiotics, which may target one or two um, bacteria. You may have a, a narrow spectrum uh, bacteria that will target just say Pseudomonas aeruginosa or say E. coli. Those are targeting the infection, but they can also still cause a disruption. So this time it is not narrow spectrum, but it's more of ultra narrow spectrum antimicrobials that are going to be designed to target a specific 
uh, microorganism or pathogen whilst leaving the rest of the uh, microbiota or community untouched. So this is a kind of precision that we are talking about. Developing therapies that target uh, a particular pathogen within the host reservoir. So that brings us to what we want to talk about, the precision antimicrobials, which are new development. So these agents are designed to target particular processes occurring in a particular pathogen or a subset of pathogens whilst leaving the rest of the um, microbes in the host untouched or unharmed. So I think this diagram best describes uh, what we are talking about, which is the precision antimicrobials. There we have your, um, your gut microbiota or all the microorganisms or microbes within the gut. Different ones, good ones, bad ones, gram positive, gram negative, um, etc. all living with us. Then the novel or precision uh, agent or antimicrobial agent is going to target one particular uh, pathogen. So when we introduce it or when it is administered, this particular one is going to target, say, one, one uh, organism, E. coli, or specifically uropathogenic E. coli. And so you see that when the drug is administered, it is only the uropathogenic E. coli, which it kills, disrupts, or destroyed, and that will fall off or be excreted or would be killed. Then the rest of the microbiota in the gut will still be safe. There will be no disruption and therefore will not face the consequences. So basically, we are trying to narrow the spectrum, and this is what precision antimicrobials is talking about. Or oh, this is the new frontier that uh, uh, the developed country is heading. I'm sure we will definitely catch up someday. Okay. So, um, how do the precision antimicrobials bring about their effect? As you said, they will target a particular pathogen. What would they do in that pathogen? So they may inhibit a critical node in the pathogen or disrupt um, the virulence in that pathogen or that uh, pathogen needs an adhesive agent, a pili or something to attach to the host. If we find a way of disrupting or inhibiting that critical node, then it may not be able to adhere or penetrate further, and then it will be destroyed. Or the precision antimicrobial can also function by killing the pathogen or organism specifically, or producing a toxin that may target that particular uh, pathogen. And so we are saying that these uh, strategies, I mean, as to how these precision microbials function are going to be uh, less likely affecting the rest of the uh, microbiota um, organisms. So that, that they will target that particular one, uh, either inhibit or reduce violence or or the adhesive or pili that they need will be disrupted and therefore at the end of the day, destroy that particular um, pathogen whilst leaving the rest of the um, microbes safe. So, um, so far, there are a few reports that have, there are, uh, that have been reported of the success of these in certain 
pathogens, especially E. coli, which is known to cause a lot of, uh, which is known to cause urinary tract infections, um, <clears throat> so, which causes um, diarrhea and other colitis and inflammatory bowel disease and all that. So there have been reported cases of um, some of these precision antimicrobials that have been discovered or studies in animals that have proven the usefulness of these precision antimicrobials have been reported, especially for E. coli, for C. difficile, and uh, pseudo, um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So we just want to have a few examples of how these um, precision antimicrobials have worked. But before you would be able to target any of these pathogens, it also means that we need to have adequate knowledge of the stages in the development, the pathogenic life cycle of that particular pathogen uh, in order to be able to find any agent that targets that particular one. So the pathogen's life cycle is very critical when it comes to precision antimicrobials, the various stages in its development, how it's able to invade um, the part of the body that it invades, the, um, the virulent factors and in that pathogen must all be very well understood before you can develop something that will target any of these processes in, in, in the pathogen. So let's look at the examples of precision treatment in, in the case of intestinal infections. Um, I think this diagram explains it very well. Uh, for intestinal infections, which eventually also lead to uh, urinary tract infections as a result of uh, invasion by uropathogenic E. coli, which we will call UPEC. The precision agent is called Manocide and Manocide is a substituted analog of Manos. This is a very promising therapeutic candidate, and there are a lot of publications um, explaining the success of, of the Manocide. So, when you look at the gut, you see that um, the UPEC or the uropathogenic E. coli needs has these pili, when you look at the, the, the diagram where one is on, on the left, the gut, this one. So this is an expansion of part of the, of the gut. The UPEC has pili that will help it to attach um, to the walls of the GI. And to attach to the walls, you will see that we have certain blue um, manosylated proteins there in the epithelial walls, which they have to attach to. But if we bring in the manocyte, which are these red, the small red uh, um, circles that you see, if they attach to the epithelial or to the manocyte, it means that the UPEC or the uropathogenic E. coli will not have the opportunity to attach itself um, to the epithelial walls and will fall off. What is this is that when the UPEC or the uropathogenic E. coli also colonizes the, um, the gut, they will also find a way um, if, if they are excreted to get into the periurethral area and then invade, ascend up, up and invade the urethra. Once they get into the urethra, then they'll eventually find their way into, so that's the expanded part here. They will eventually find their way into the bladder. And that is why they can cause um, urinary tract infections, which are usually caused by E. coli. In the bladder, they will also use their pili to attach uh, to the epithelial walls and then 
enter into the uh, epithelial cells. Then they will now extend and form and then be e flat out. But if the monocyte attaches to them, the red one, they will not be able to bind to the epithelia and invade their bladder. And so in this case, we, they, we have been successful in using uh, a precision antimicrobial, as in monocyte, and having understood or understanding how the uropathogenic E. coli attaches to the walls of the intestines or to the bladder to invade, we have used this precise medication to prevent the attachment um, by making it attach to the pili and preventing it to attach to the walls of, of, the, of the GIT or the bladder. So basically, this is an explanation of how um, the precision medications will work. We have to understand the, the cycles of virulence or adhesives in the pathogen and be able to disrupt them in that particular pathogen. We can also give other examples of precision treatments for other intestinal infections. So another agent, apart from manocide, another agent called abidocin CD is also been uh, tested and have been found to help to kill C. difficile and but not disrupt the other gut microbiota. Another antivirulence drug called bezlotuzumab have also been found to be able to inhibit or destroy the virulence pathways in C. difficile. So the toxins that are produced by C. difficile, which will cause the inflammation in the gut, uh, are being uh, inhibited or destroyed by these um, precision agents. Several others uh, are also being approved by the FDA for use as therapeutics. And these have been able to neutralize the toxins that are produced by uh, not only C. difficile, but also Clostridium botulinum and also other toxins produced by bacillus anthracis. So, I mean, progress is being made in, in those areas. So that is basically for intestinal infections and others. We can also give examples of precision medications uh, for respiratory tract infections. So we know that usually um, in the nasopharynx, you have streptococcus pneumonia and also non therapyable hemophilus uh, influenza, NTHI, um, that are commensals which are resident in the human nasopharynx. But they are also known, uh, if they become pathogenic, to move from the nasopharynx and move to other parts of the ENT into the inner ear. They can also cause diseases like sinus conjunctivitis, and others. So if there is the use of antibiotics or a broad spectrum of antibiotics that disrupts the, the microbiota in that part or there's dysbiosis uh, as a result of exposure to any antibiotic, there's strep pneumonia or the NTH can move, become pathogenic, and infect the inner ear, causing inflammation of the inner ear or what we call otitis media. And then when they, they cause otitis media, they are also able to form a biofilm around themselves. You know that one of the resistant mechanisms is formation of biofilms. So when they form biofilms in the inner ear, they prevent, um, the other medications from getting in to kill the actual pathogens in there. And so precision medications are, are being uh, developed to be able to disrupt the formation of the biofilms and be able to target the pathogen as in whether it's streps pneumonia or NTHI 
within the inner ear to be able to treat the otitis media because when they form those biofilms, it makes treatment difficult. And the, so the person will experience chronic uh, ear infection or recurrent otitis media. And therefore, um, they are never free. I mean, because the, 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 the drugs don't actually get to kill all the bacteria. And so it's like treatment goes on and then the, the, the condition reoccurs again. So if we get precision medications that will be able to disrupt um, the pathogen violence factors in there, then there will be a better options. We can also talk about precision treatment when it comes to skin infection. We know that Pseudomonas aeruginosa uh, is a common cause of skin and soft tissue infections, especially in patients who have burns uh, when the wounds the burn wounds become infected. Usually the pathogen there is Pseudomonas aeruginosa or for diabetic wounds which have become infected, usually uh, the suspected pathogen is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And fortunately, uh, strides have been made uh, to find therapeutic agents uh, which are lectins and uh, precision medications, which are being tested or in clinical trial. We have leg A and uh, leg B, which are being tested um, as agents that can um, be able to disrupt the pathway of the Pseudomonas aeruginosa and therefore help in the healing of um, these soft tissue infections, uh, the skin infections, which are caused by Pseudomonas. And you know that Pseudomonas also colonizes catheters for patients uh, who have uh, problems and are wearing catheters. They can also uh, invade and cause um, infections. And so if we could find precision medications against these, they will also be very useful. Again, for skin infections, we also know of propionibacterium acne, which causes acne, acne vulgaris, uh, in, in, especially in adolescents and others. Uh, and also natural products from Staphylococcus epidemi uh, epidemicus, uh, known as succinic acid, have also been discovered and have been known to be able to disrupt um, this stuff epidemides and therefore can be useful uh, in the management of acne. And, and so that is also another example for precision treatment for skin infections. Well, so we have seen that these precision antimicrobials can be very useful um, to us, but of course, they are not without challenges or the discoveries are, are not without challenges. Just like uh, our traditional antimicrobial agents or uh, broad spectrum or narrow spectrum antimicrobial agents may also have challenges. Same way in the discovery and development of these precision antimicrobials, some of the challenges that need to be overcome or the hurdles that need to be overcome include the toxicity profile of these agents. They may be efficacious, but what about the toxicity? So that also needs to be uh, well researched into before they can uh, be used clinically. And uh, there, are, there may also be challenges like uh, bioavailability, the same challenges in drug discovery and development. After discovering a compound, the, the development path or the pharmaceutics path or formulation path, bioavailability, solubility, uh, disintegration, and all those are also challenges. And then also feasibility of manufacturing of these uh, agents on a large scale. These are very fantastic ideas. But what if we need to produce them or, or scale them uh, on a large scale to be able to uh, solve global issues, just like some of our broad spectrum antibiotics 
are doing currently, uh, is it feasible? Can that be done? These are some of the challenges um, that must be overcome. And also um, the way the thing is specific to the pathogen, then it means that we have to properly have a detailed understanding of the mechanism that drives the infection cycle of that particular pathogen. We must properly understand the, the violence factors. I mean, we must have proper understanding of every step in the pathogen to be able to find something that will be unique or peculiar to that pathogen and not affect all the other microbiota. Then also, one challenge that we have with our, uh, our current medications is the rapid diagnostics. So if we have to use this precision medication, it means that for every infection, there should be a, a diagnostic test or a rapid diagnosis test to ascertain which pathogen it is, which is exactly causing infection. But this is a challenge we, we, we face already, the fact that uh, most of the time, the, the diagnostic tests are not done before antibiotics are prescribed. That's why broad spectrum antibiotics will be given for every infection uh, to be able to um, counter that infection. So our, our facilities uh, in place said that for every infection, a rapid diagnostics is done uh, to establish which pathogen before. So those are also some other challenges. And then also polymicrobial infections. So you know that for some disease conditions, it's not just one pathogen. There may be um, um, just more than one, two or three, uh, contributing to that infection. How will we be able to find that one precision agent to be able to deal with all the um, polymicros in a particular infection? So the bacterial community dynamics will have to be studied very well. And uh, these require a lot of detailed research and uh, with precision in order to come out with these precision medications. So there are still a lot of questions and which require so many investigations and there must still be collaboration between academics, uh, labs, uh, pharmaceutical companies in order to come up with these uh, precision medications that can feed uh, the whole population uh, globally. So yes, the idea is very good. Some strides have been made and still um, a lot of strides are being made. Some of the compounds are in clinical trials and others, but we must also not uh, overlook some of these challenges which must be taken into consideration. So that brings me to the end of our exposure to what precision medications are uh, how they work, or, and the ones which have so far been uh, discovered and published, and some of the challenges that need to uh, be overcome. But just in a few minutes, I also want to say that in our part of the world, as I said, we might not have reached um, there yet when it comes to precision medication. So, well, I work in the area of natural product drug discovery. And so at this stage, if you want to go into research, drug discovery and development, because we are endowed with so many uh, natural plants, which traditionally are herbalists use and others, it will also be good that as researchers in AML, we look at how we can find new compounds um, that can be developed as drugs. So looking at the therapeutic development pipeline, tens of thousands of compounds need to be discovered because as they go through the preclinical stages uh, and clinical trials, some of them will fill the, the tests and so we may get 
one approved drug at the patient bedside, it takes about a minimum of um, 12 to 15 years to do so. So it means that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done at the drug discovery step. And since we have at our disposal in Africa, a lot of natural products, that is why some of us are still going into these uh, natural products uh, discovery whilst we wait to get to uh, the developed country stage of the precision medication, et cetera. And we can give examples of several plants that have produced compounds that are now used as drugs like morphine, heroin, doxin, uh, senna, all came from different plants, opium poppy, Digitalis papyria, Cassia plants, we get mesenaco and others which are used for diarrhea, these for cardiovascular, digoxin for cardiovascular conditions, etc. Even when it comes to infections, we can give examples of several compounds that were discovered from plants, uh, like rifampicin, streptomycin, uh, um, so many of them, Eleftheria terra, uh, Texobacton, which is the current one discovered around 2016, are all antibacterial agents, which come from natural sources, whether microorganisms or plants. And so there's still hope to look up to these areas or sources as well to find new compounds. And that is why we work um, to find compounds from allium species. But I guess this will be a um, um, discussion for another day where we want to talk about natural products. So the, the compounds we get from the plant, we then synthesize analogs uh, from them and check for activity of these compounds against a lot of microbes and also do other uh, resistant mechanisms apart from checking their cytotoxicity profiles. We talk about, say, EFLAS pump inhibition assays because one of the resistant mechanisms of bacteria is that they are able, some have EFLAS pumps that are able to pump out the drugs from their, from their cells. And that contributes to resistance because the drug does not accumulate to reach um, therapeutic levels that can kill the microorganism. And so if we find agents, maybe from plants or from compounds, which are EFLAS pump inhibitors, then we'll be combating some of the resistant mechanisms in bacteria. Another way is uh, the formation of biofilm. We talk about an example, like um, those forming in the inner ear. Biofilms form in catheters, biofilms form around our teeth, the yellowish and green uh, plaques on our teeth is bacteria forming biofilm and hiding within it. Biofilm form on surfaces in the hospital environment when they are not properly cleaned with the right percentage of disinfectants. All these things contribute to infections, nosocomia or hospital infections, et cetera. And so if we also find agents that are able to inhibit biofilms, uh, they could also be helpful in combating uh, antimicrobial resistance. So these are the areas that we work in and continue to publish in using um, different plant species from the allium family, garlic, onions, and um, other cranial species, which are also bulb-like plants that we have in our environments and so that we have a lot of publications on these as well we could go into more details in another session and so we also are co collaborating with the university of oxford because they are also targeting other resistant mechanisms like the enzymes that help to uh, put the cross links in say microbiome cell wall together which is very complex and, and does not allow the drugs to work. So basically, these are some of the things that um, we are doing currently. But we hope that in the near future, we would also be able to contribute to bridging the gap between the bench side 
which is the research area, and then the patient bedside by getting them the right drug and tackling antimicrobial resistance. So I'll say thank you very much uh, for your time and I'll open up for any discussions. Over to you, Jimmy. Okay, thank you so much, Bro. That's a wonderful and a great presentation. We have really learned a lot. And uh, I do hope that uh, students, my fellow students, have also pick up something as far as uh, uh, precision medicine and precision antimicrobial specifically are concerned mm -hmm. as one of the ways to tackle antimicrobial resistance. Very insightful uh, presentation. And uh, it is actually intriguing. And uh, I do ask my fellow students also to pick some uh, areas of interest, like maybe, for example, the precision medicine, because we can see that is where uh, the world is moving into, as well as uh, the researchers. Maybe that would be the future of uh, antimicrobial research and discovery is uh, a way of mitigating MR. Thank you so much, Prof. And uh, I think, yeah, maybe uh, for those who have questions, we can hold on a bit because we are moving to our next uh, theme. Uh, so maybe the question and answer session will come thereafter. And uh, let me kindly uh, invite our second speaker, who is uh, Faith, to take us through uh, the, next, the next part of uh, the workshop. And uh, that is exploration and uh, uh, introduction on how we are doing, or maybe the use of nanotechnology in research and development of antimicrobials. It's another interesting area in antimicrobial research and discovery. And I also hope that uh, we begin so that as students, this is one of the interesting areas to pick uh, a point or two from. So uh, Faith Zablon is currently doing her PhD in nanoengineering, that is synthetic biology, at the Joint School of Nanoscience and Nanoengineering, North Carolina a t State University in USA. She has a BSc degree in microbiology and an MSc degree in immunology and microbiology from Madurai Kamaraj University in India. Her current research uh, focuses on cancer uh, diagnostics as diagnosis and treatment and fabricating biosensing platforms using 2D materials and nanoparticles such as gold. She presently specializes in her work using the scanning electron microscope, UV vis spectrophotometer and Raman spectroscopy. She is actively involved in cancer sensitization, seminars and research projects with the Integrated Cancer Research Foundation of Kenya. That is our second speaker, Sablon Faith. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Zablon, for making to this session. I know yeah, it is quite early where you are, but I really appreciate that uh, you have uh, tried and make uh, to attend this session today. So uh, let me hand now this time to Zablon to take us through the next part of the workshop. Over to you, work, um, Zablon. Thank you so much, Jamie. I hope you can all hear me. Yeah. Yeah, sure, we can hear you. Yes, it's pretty early, it's almost six, um, but I had to make the effort because I honor the invitation and antimicrobial resistance is an area that I was interested in, in as much as I don't work on it right now, but I hope with research, you know, you never know where it takes you. So thank you so much. My name is Faith Zablon, as Jimmy has said, and I am doing a PhD in nanoengineering synthetic biology in North Carolina a and State University. My research focus is in cancer and I use nanomaterials, majorly I use gold nanoparticles and I'm designing uh, theranostic platforms that is theranostics means diagnosis and therapy. So I'm functionalizing gold nanoparticles to be a platform that I can be able to use in early detection of cancer. And I can also use it to monitor cancer and even be able to uh, predict drug, resi drug resistance. So drug resistance is not only a challenge in bacteria and viruses and fungi, it is also a challenge even when you're talking about cancer. So uh, what I'll be presenting to you is basically an introduction into the use of nanotechnology in antimicrobial, antimicrobial resistance because nanotechnology is big. 
even as I was trying to prepare these slides, I was preparing them while on a flight. Actually, I was on a workshop and I arrived here at 1 a.m. I have only had a couple of hours to sleep, but you know, I'm dedicated to sensitizing as much knowledge as I can to my country. And I am passionate about it. And I hope this is going to be more of an introduction, but you know, for research aspects, those interested in research, it could be a foundation that lays, you know, the foundation for you for future uh, for your future research. Okay, so I have enjoyed the introduction given by Professor Cynthia, and uh, she has basically elaborated a lot more than I'm going to do because mine I'll just focus on the research aspects of nanomaterials in antimicrobial resistance or in tackling antimicrobial resistance. So what do we know about AMR? I guess it's something that you already know because um, from what I read from the profile of your website, you guys already have done so much on antimicrobial resistance. So we know that it is a global pandemic according to the World Health Organization currently causing about 700,000 deaths yearly and it is predicted but that by 2050 we'll be having 10 million deaths per year out of antimicrobial resistance and this is as a result of misuse or underuse or excessive use of antimicrobials and these antimicrobials they kind of spill into the environment from the human waste into the animals into the plants and into the aquatic life. So it is more of a life cycle between the ecosystems. And we know very well that Dr. Cynthia has mentioned that it is an socioeconomic, it has adverse socioeconomic impacts in that the production rates of antibiotic over the years has reduced. This is because a lot of companies find it non-profitable and they are therefore they are not able to produce this antibiotic. They cannot meet the, the, the consumption rate of the humans along the, with the production. And the emergence of the antimicrobial resistance has led to you know, these companies closing because they don't see a profit out of these productions. Therefore, we have seen like in the United States, several companies are currently closing because they cannot afford to produce antimicrobials. And we have seen this decline over the years because it was very high you know, in the 80s, but now this is 20, uh, you know, this is 2024, according, 2014, according to this graph, and it has reduced. As compared to the cancer drugs, you can see this, an increase in the cancer drug production as compared to the antimicrobial. So it is a high risk, and now we need strategies on how we can be able to tackle this antimicrobial resistance. And nanomaterials are a very good um, approach to tackling antimicrobial resistance. So basically, um, Alexander Fleming, I just like this part of my presentation because antimicrobial resistance was predicted in the 1940s by Alexander Fleming. And uh, I like the speech that he gave during his um, Nobel Prize winning uh, speech. He mentioned that in as much as penicillin by all intent was non-poisonous, there was a problem with using an or under usage of this antimicrobial. This, he gave a very uh, good example whereby he elaborated over Mr. X having a sore throat and he buys penicillin, gives it to himself. And when he sees that the symptoms have reduced, he stops, he stops taking the antimicrobial. Unfortunately, he infects the wife and the wife gets pneumonia. So it's no longer just a sore throat, it becomes pneumonia. And there, when the doctors are treating this, um, pneumonia with penicillin, it couldn't work. And it was not working because the infection that was infect, uh, transmitted into the wife had already become resistant to penicillin, so it will not work. And this woman died. So who was actually the cause of death of this woman? It was the husband because he was ignorant of using enough quantity of penicillin to treat the microorganism. So since it was earlier on predicted, uh, we should have been aware that this might happen because we misuse these antibiotics. 
Fortunately or unfortunately, we are developing new strategies on how we can be able to tackle these. So I like the fact that this organization is looking at the superbugs, which are the high priority type of microorganisms that have developed a wide range of um, resistance even to the broad spectrum antibiotics. So in this part of my presentation, you can see that new strategies include new anti uh, antibiotics, which is not happening currently because most companies are not doing that. We have uh, the use of, of uh, I think, bacteriophages. We have nanoparticles, which I'll be talking to you about. And then we have newer strategies like synergistic um, approaches where Dr. Sinti has said that she's using medicinal chemistry to synthesize new antimicrobials from plants. So those are new approaches that are actually coming up. So, um, Basically, this is something I will assume that you already know, but you know, antimicrobial activity or the role of anti antibiotics is basically to act on the cell wall synthesis, on elements produced by this bacteria, cytoplasmic membrane, and even the synthesis of proteins, DNA, and inhibition of RNA. However, with antimicrobial resistance, new mechanisms are emerging. These antimicrobial, uh, these antibiotics, while they are getting into the bacterial cell, they encounter enzymes that degrade them. They encounter efflux pumps that remove the antibiotic from the system. They encounter a, you know, a microorganism that can be able to mutate and form its own, uh, modify its own cell. And therefore the antibiotic cannot act because this, the cell wall has already been modified. And then we also see that they, they develop these receptors that evade the mechanism of the antibiotic and some other mechanisms, they just automatically release the antibiotic out of the cells. So what strategies are being used in tackling AMR, which I'm assuming that we all know right now. So we have synergistic approaches using medicinal plants along with the antimicrobials and combined therapies. So we have you can repurpose drugs like take small quantities of vancomycin, take small uh, components of fluoroquines and put them together and kind of try to see if they're effective. And then there are other strategies like the use of nanotechnology. And in this case, we are using nanomaterials. So other strategies can be, you know, in as much as we really want to tackle antimicrobial resistance, we could improve on detecting antimicrobial resistance in the early stages. And that means that if we could be able to detect this bacteria, especially the high priority type of uh, antimicrobial uh, bacteria, then we can be able to tackle antimicrobial resistance early. And then we have better strategies in the stewardship programs that we have. So if clinicians, if nurses could be able to uh, protect the patients, especially the patients in ICU who use catheters, such that they're, they're protected against this bacteria or the high priority antimicrobial resistant bacteria, then they can be able to be protected against developing these uh, infections. Then of course, clinical research is fundamental to anything that we do right now, because we no longer have companies that are producing effective antibiotics. So it is crucial for us to engage in clinical research that can be able to help us to develop new antimicrobials. At the same time, effective health education, sensitizing the public about the importance of consuming antimicrobials the right way. And then antibiotic review kits. So I was going through a website known as the American Society of Microbiology, and they have developed a program of about eight strategies on how you can be able to tackle AMR. There is a clinical aspect to it, and then there is the individual aspects of tackling antimicrobial resistance. So I would encourage you to check the American Society of Microbiology to just look at the program that they have that they define as the antibiotic review kit. So now I'm diving into the materials that are being used for antimicrobial development. So nanomaterials basically are extremely small particles that can, you know, at the quantum, we call them at the quantum state, at the atomic state. So they have specific type of structures and because of their small sizes, it helps us scientists to be able to functionalize them on the surface and even inside them to 
be able to either diagnose a disease or to deliver a drug that we want. So there are several materials or nanomaterials that are being used currently. So we have coronas, they are called virus-like nanomaterials, they're called um, coronas. We have micella. So micella are basically um, a type of carbon uh, nanomaterial made up of carbon atoms that are aggregated together. So micellas are used majorly for um, diagnosis, but I have seen some papers that describe micellas as uh, being used as platforms for delivery of antimicrobials. Then we have liposomes. These are just nanoparticles made up of lipids. They have a hollow inside that majorly has like a hydrophilic um, kind of environment where you can put in your drug and then deliver it to your target site. We have nanotubes, they're just tubes that can be able to deliver drugs. We have nanospheres. In general, we have a wide range of nanomaterials that we can be able to use in detecting antimicrobial resistance, and we can also use for delivering of antimicrobial drugs. So the classification of nanomaterials can be, several scientists can classify nanomaterials in different ways, but we classify them in three major categories. So we have carbon-based nanomaterials. These are materials derived from carbon. So what we know about carbon, it is highly, you know, it's, it's available. Graphene, I'm, I'm going to assume that you know about graphene or coal, the charcoal that we use back home, that is carbon. So scientists have come around an idea of developing these carbon into atoms and making structures out of this carbon that they can be used for different applications. And in this case, we're using them for as antimicrobials and we are using them to deliver drugs. We have organic and inorganic materials. So these include like gold nanoparticles, zinc oxide, nanofibers. So all those, some of them I'm going to mention here and how they can be used. So nanomaterials in, uh, in tackling antimicrobial resistance, they can be used to detect this um, bacteria that eventually become resistant. They can be used even as antimicrobials. So instead of using the drug, you can use materials as an antimicrobial drug. Then they can also be used as drug delivery systems. So I will show you an example of liposomes and how we can be able to put in a drug inside the hollow Part, part of the liposome and deliver a drug into the body. And then and, uh, these materials have improved efficacy as compared to the antimicrobials that we already have in the market. So and, um, nanomaterials have defined properties. So because they are at a nanoscale, that means even the way you're going to visualize them is at the nanoscale. So we are no longer in the micro scale, we are in the nanoscale. So because of their extremely small, uh, small sizes, we define them as, as having unique physiochemical properties that is in terms of their sizes. So the smaller they are, if you can be able to use a nanoparticle and put it inside a microorganism. So the scale between the nano and the micro, you can see it is one to power six. So that means a small nanoparticle can be put inside a bacteria and it can, you know, it can perform the function that you want it to, it to do. So the good thing about nanomaterials, they have these properties that we can customize and functionalize the way that we want them to do. So I'll show you on how we can be able to modify these materials later on. So their small sizes gives them a large surface area to be able to functionalize them the way you want, to deliver cargo to their target site. That is what makes them as very essential um, materials for us to use in antimicrobials. And then uh, they can be engineered, you know, the way you want to engineer them, the way you want to modify them. But what is important with nanomaterials, you need to understand their properties for you to be able to functionalize them. So a lot of nano nanomaterials have been used to tackle the overexpression of proteins, they degrade DNA, they degrade RNA. And this is what we are looking for when we are looking at antimicrobials. So what is very specific to us when we are looking at antimicrobial approaches is the size of the nanomaterial, 
the surface modification, we need to be able to modify it. It has to be biocompatible such that it does not affect the mammalian cell, which is your cell, and it affects or degrades the bacterial cell. And then it has to have properties like hydrophilicity, hydrophobicity, that is very, very important. Is it absorbed by water? Does it resist water so that it can deliver your drug and be eliminated by your body? And then nanoparticles ought to be able to break down. So hydroph uh, hydrophilic type of nanomaterials can be able to be absorbed and they can be broken down within the body itself and eliminated by the kidney. And then they have to be able to be taken up by the cells. So this is something I'll just mention, I'll not explain so much how materials, are, how these nanoparticles are synthesized. So there are different approaches in which you can synthesize um, nanomaterials. So we have top down, this is where you just, a bulk material like coal is degraded down into a carbon nanomaterial. Then we have bottom up approaches. Um, I don't know if you've heard of silicon. Silicon is um, a material that is prepared from sun. So you melt the sun and by the end of the day, you have a silicon wafer. And this silicon, we use it a lot in functionalizing our nanomaterials. Even we use silicon for our fonts. So silicon is the most abundant nanomaterial we have in the world. And it is the one that is most used to synthesize nanoparticles. And then we have another approach that is quite natural to us, and I think it could relate to Dr. Cynthia, is the green synthesis. This is synthesizing nanomaterials from plants and microorganisms. These materials are normally easy, uh, they're biocompatible, they are easy to degrade because they are produced from natural products like plants and microorganisms. So after you synthesize your material, it is very important for you to characterize because you don't just want to use a material and you know, put it in somebody else's body and it is toxic. So there are properties that you have to look at before you can be able to use it in biological applications. So different techniques that we use in the lab that I work in, we use dynamic light, a scatter, and a, nano, a nanoparticle tracking analysis. This helps you to, to determine the size and the stability. Size is very important because you don't want to put an extremely large nanoparticle into the body of an individual, and then the body cannot be able to eliminate it. And you also don't want to use an extremely small nanoparticle that can be retained by the body because some of the disadvantages of nanoparticles is that they are cytotoxic. So the smaller they are, the less they are less likely to be eliminated by the body. Then we use the scanning electron microscope, the transmission electron microscope. This helps you to, to see the morphology of your nanoparticle, the size, and even the topography, because this, the way it looks on the surface is essential, especially when you want to functionalize a protein or an antibody or uh, an RNA or a DNA on the surface. And then stability and absorbance is very important because stability is basically this material being able to enter into the biological system remains stable to deliver either your drug, to deliver an antibody or to deliver a protein and still be able to be eliminated by the body. And then we have, you need to understand the chemistry of your material in that, you know, the composition. Some materials are prepared not only by one metal, but several other materials. So we have like zinc is prepared by uh, with oxide, so zinc oxide, you need to know that you have a zinc oxide that is stable enough to deliver your drug. So these are some of the instruments that we use. We have the DLS, the NTA, scanning electron microscope, the TM, the UVVs, and the XPS. So I think I have repeated this uh, over and over again. So the size and the shape of the material is very important. Functionalization is what is very crucial to us because materials, when you want to functionalize them, then you need to understand the properties of size, the shape, and even high biocompatibility. So functionalization basically means taking your material, conjugating uh, any, anything that you want to deliver into the system, be it a protein, be it a lipid, you functionalize it on the surface of that material. So functionalization means 
you are coating the material that you want on the surface of your nanoparticle and delivering it into the system. So once you understand these properties, then there are many applications that you can use them for. Like gold nanoparticles are majorly used in delivering drugs. They can be used in uh, diagnose, uh, diagnosis of diseases. They can be used in imaging, especially in cancer tumors. And they're also used in therapy, especially in cancer. So. The smaller the size, the more robust the reaction that you're going to have, and the more the advanced, uh, the, the, the chemical effectivity of your material in terms of diagnosis and even in treatment of your disease. So nanomaterials are used to combat bacteria because they induce a cellular toxic mechanism that, that um, helps you to degrade the bacteria. That means they act on the cell membrane, they're able to act on the nucleic acid, they're also able to act on the proteins of the bacteria. So they can also act as a medium for carrying and transporting the drugs. So the modifications that I've been talking about are functionalization on the surface or inside the nanomaterials. So this is how we functionalize the materials. So for example, this could be a gold nanoparticle and you want to deliver a drug. So what you do is you need to understand the chemistry of the material that you want, you're working with. I work with gold, so I know that to functionalize any material on gold, I'm going to use what is called a thiol group. A thiol group is basically a sulfur group that has a high affinity to gold. So this is based on the surface charges of the gold and the charge on the thiol group. So I, I will mobilize the surface of the gold with a thiol group, attach a drug on the surface of this um, uh, gold nanoparticle and deliver it into the system or into the mammalian cell or into the bacteria. So depending on what you want to deliver, you can functionalize the surface of your material. At the same time, if you want to use your material to deliver a drug, liposomes are very good. Liposomes are basically lipids with a hollow inside. It has some liquid or um, hydrophilic, um, a hydrophobic surface on the inside. So what you do is you insert your drug inside the liposome and this liposome will effectively deliver your drug to the side, target site. So I just, uh, I liked this paragraph that I put down here. Non-functionalized materials often exhibit nano, narrow spectra activities. This means that if you don't functionalize your material, if you don't um, like dictate what it is going to do, it is going to act ineffectively. But if you can be able to functionalize the surface or inside uh, the, the, the material, then it will effectively do what you want it to do. So understanding the surface chemistry of your material is very critical to modulate their interaction with the bacteria, improve their broad spectra activity while simultaneously reducing toxicity against mammalian cells. So examples of nanomaterials that I'm going to mention here, just a few because there are so many, I wouldn't finish. Uh, so we have carbon-based materials. So these are materials prepared from carbon. So the good thing with, um, with nanoengineering is you are able to synthesize your material and you know, modify the shape that you want out of it. So depending on what you want to use it for, you can, make the shape that you want. So we have carbon nanotubes, we have carbon wires, we have carbon monosheets. So all these can be used for different functions. So examples of carbon nanotubes have been used um, to induce uh, membrane stress on the cell membrane and uh, induced stress on the cell membrane allows the degradation of the cell membrane and releasing of any materials from inside the bacterial cells. Then we have fullerenes. Fullerenes are basically monosheets of um, um, no, carbon. I don't know, I can, yeah. So this is a circular type of fullerene. Fullerene, they're just carbon uh, carbon atoms that are put together. They, they can be spherical, they can be a monolayer, just depending on how you want to use them. And they have been used to induce oxidative stress or reactive oxy oxygen a species that disrupts the nucleic acids like the RNA and even the cell wall of the bacteria. 
Then we have graphene. So graphene is used in terms of graphene oxides. It is also a nano sheet. And the, the advantage of using graphene is the fact that it is hydrophilic. Therefore, it's able to be absorbed by the cell, allowing uh, the degradation of RNA and disrupting the cell membrane of the bacteria. And there has been a lot of research on graphene oxide that have been used to tackle gram positive and gram negative because it has the ability to degrade the peptidoglycan, it has the ability to degrade the lipids. And then we have gold nanoparticles, which are the most commonly used. So gold nanoparticles have a biocompatibility proper, property and a lot of people use it because it's very easy to functionalize the surface. Uh, the surface chemistry of gold nanoparticles is very easy. So you can do anything to a gold nanoparticle. I use gold nanoparticles and functionalize with thiol groups, but some people will use polymers to functionalize the surface of the gold nanoparticle, conjugate drugs on the surface of this gold nanoparticle and deliver it into the system. So functionalization of gold nanoparticles has been shown to be very effective against gram positive and gram negative bacteria. So they act on the cell membrane, they act on the proteins, they act on the ribosomes, and they, um, they are able to degrade all these components of the bacteria. This shows uh, that they can be used as antimicrobials. They can also be used as delivery systems for antimicrobial drugs. So um, here, this is just you know some notes that I was making. But synergistic coupling with antimicrobials with a gold nanoparticle has proved to be very effective. There is some data that I showed that. Uh, functionalizing the surface of gold nanoparticle with streptomycin is very effective against gram positive and gram negative bacteria. And using polymers uh, has also been very effective because you functionalize the surface of the gold nanoparticle with a polymer and couple it with ampicillin antibiotic, which seems to be more effective than just using ampicillin by itself. Then we have silver nanoparticles that are also have very good um, antimicrobial activities. So silver nanoparticles have been used for decades because Egyptians actually started using silver to treat wounds. Uh, silver has been used to coat like surgical um, surfaces of devices. And this uh, has helped to prevent like a septic uh, development of wounds. And Silver uh, nanoparticles in their compounds can target cell division, inhibiting cell division. They can target the RNA, uh, the, the DNA interactions. They can uh, target RNA uh, synthesis, therefore, it, therefore inhibiting protein synthesis. And silver nanoparticle, when conjugated with sulfur and nitrogen, they can be able to destroy the bacterial structure by binding to thiol groups and the amino groups in the bacteria. And then we have a synergistic effects by combining of a silver nanoparticles with antimicrobials like the broad spectrum antibiotic vancomycin has shown to be very effective in a gram positive and gram negative. But what I have to mention here is that nanoparticles are, it's more of a research uh, aspect because I'm not aware of materials that have been used in a clinical setup to actually treat antimicrobial resistance. So other materials are zinc oxides. And then I will just um, finish by talking about the liposomes because liposomes are very interesting. They are very biocompatible. They do not have um, toxicity. As compared to the materials that I have talked to, to you before the gold, this uh, uh, zinc oxide, titanium oxide, these materials are toxic. So they are level that you can deliver into the system of an individual that makes them toxic. So in that case, we want to look at materials that are more biocompatible, that are easy to eliminate from the body. And liposomes are those because these are just lipids. So most of them are synthetic lipids that have been uh, that can be functionalized the way you want. So the hollow in uh, the hollow part of the lipids, you can actually put in your drug inside the lipids and target it to the site or to the bacteria, and it can be able to uh, deliver your drug and effectively degrade the uh, the bacteria. So so much has already been done, and liposomes actually are the the fast nanomaterials that are in the market or they're 
you know, competing to be in the market as alternative antimicrobial drug delivery systems for different antimicrobial, uh, uh, for different antimicrobials. So the advantages of liposomes is the, is the fact that they're hydrophilic and they're hydrophobic, making them able to deliver drugs effectively to the system. And the hollow part allows you to be able to put in as much load of the, uh, the drug that you want to deliver effectively. And um, of course, each of these materials, like I've said, they have disadvantages. The cytotoxicity is extremely high, which makes it very important to us to do more research on how we can reduce the cytotoxicity. So this is just uh, you know, some articles that I found on a research uh, aspect where a gold nanoparticle was functionalized with vancomycin and they showed effectivity in destruction of the cell wall of a bacteria. Then we have silver nanoparticles functionalized with ampicillin and they were very effective in destroying the cell wall of the bacteria, degrading the DNA and even degrading the ribosomes of the bacteria. And then these are iron oxides that have an oxidative stress effect and an oxidative stress effect and they can be used in apoptosis, they can be used in bioinflammation, biodegradation, and other um, diseases like cancer. So the challenges, like I've said, challenges of using materials, nanomaterials and antimicrobial is the fact that these materials can be extremely expensive. Uh, their cytotoxicity is extremely high. Stability is a factor. That is why we look at how can we uh, functionalize the surface of these materials to make them more stable. Re reproducibility. So reproducibility is very important because you want to ensure that the efficacy of the material you deliver is consistent. So if you're delivering a dosage of 20 micrograms of a drug to an individual, to one patient, this should be reproducible to the next patient. So this is one of the biggest challenges of materials. That is why stability is very important when you're looking at materials. And then we have seen reduced efficacy over the period because re reproducibility is a factor when it comes to materials as antimicrobials. Otherwise, I want to thank you for attending and listening. I hope this opens an interesting view into the use of materials in your research if you want to get into research. But I'm also hoping that at some point we're gonna be able to translate this research into clinical applications for our patients. Thank you and I invite any questions. Thank you so much, Zabron, for that uh, very educative uh, presentation on the use of nanoparticles in research and development of antimicrobials. Very interesting, and uh, I do appreciate uh, your um, presentation. It is quite simple. Actually, I like the way you've just put it. Uh, in a way that uh, we can, um, everyone can easily understand. And I do hope that uh, it has opened uh, avenues of research among the students. Explore more on the actually the concept that you've just mentioned uh, as far as nanoparticles uh, are used in research and development of antimicrobials. Thank you so much for that great presentation. And uh, as we wait for the questions to come in, because now we have now a bit, uh, very few minutes to go, and uh, just to like. Uh, Maybe uh, maybe we can wait for some minutes. Uh, for those who may have some questions, we can uh, uh, yeah we can excuse you for about uh, five minutes or so before uh, we release uh, our speakers. And uh, an an important concept that I've picked up from the last presentation that is on the nanoparticles is on the concept of. Uh, a, functionality of uh, the nanoparticle. Very interesting to note that. And uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, it's... Hello? Someone is speaking, please. Keep off your mic, please. OK, OK, we can continue. Thank you so much. So uh, I was uh, saying about the concept of functionality. And thank you so much for mentioning about that. And uh, maybe, uh, yeah, there are a lot of areas in nanotechnology and uh, 
we appreciate that uh, you have tried to mention uh, them all in a very wide way and that is interesting because that's one of uh, actually uh, letting the students to actually identify one of the areas to explore in those that will see that it's interesting in areas of undemocratic research and development and another interesting thing about uh, nanomaterials is that uh, they have a very wide applicability be it in treatment of infectious diseases as well as cancer and all those. And uh, thank you so much that uh, despite being in the area of uh, cancer research, you have also uh, uh, tried to and uh, you managed to uh, put that uh, connection together because you can see uh, the threat of antimicrobial resistance actually is a huge problem also in cancer patients. And uh, there is a wide uh, connection between the two. And also uh, maybe in research, uh, the students can also maybe explore on how this or how these uh, nanomaterials could be used to uh, complement the two areas of interest in research. Thank you so much. So uh, maybe uh, if we don't have more questions, I just would like to ask a quick question and that goes to uh, Professor Cynthia. I hope you can uh, hear us now. And uh, I just would like to uh, understand maybe how do we make sure that uh uh okay can see someone is raising the question but let me just finish okay so so i would ensure that uh, the precision antimicrobials that we are developing are specific to a particular target pathogen is it what actually as a researcher what should guide me in this is it the sequences should i first sequence the pathogen that i'm targeting or what actually should guide me to make sure that i am uh, targeting that particular pathogen of interest over to you prof Thank you very much for your question. Like I said, um, a lot has to go into, into this precision uh, antimicrobials. And since the focus will be on the pathogen's life cycle and its violence and others, I don't think it should be out of place to still better understand it uh, as much as possible. If if that means going to the extent of the sequencing and others to make us have more information, I think it wouldn't be out of place because uh, we want to target something that is unique in the pathogen as much as possible and which will not also affect the rest of the microbiota. So uh, I think whatever it takes to know more and get more information will not be out of place. That's what I think. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. So, uh, Fifa, Fifa Braka, if you can hear me, uh, you can go on, please. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. This is uh, Fifa Braka from one of the Friedrich Alexander University in Germany. Um, thank you for the very insightful uh, presentations, uh, which uh, uh, provide insights on a very important area uh, uh, of interest that has to be uh, taken care of. My question go to Professor Cynthia uh, and also spill over to Ms. Uh, uh, Zabun's uh, presentation. Um, Usually, uh, mm, the normal antimicrobials that we have um, have been based on uh, the molecular, uh, molecular speaking, they've been based on understanding uh, and targeting very highly conserved regions um, in the, in the, the genomes of these antimicrobials. Uh, uh, and the uh, the success uh, before the the, the 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 rise of antimicrobial resistance. Um, you've spoken about uh, precision antimicrobial therapy, uh, which is also very interesting. I'm just curious to understand. Uh, that would mean that um, we would have to understand the specific genetic profile of a particular microorganism 
and design and design um, and design therapies that would uh, target uh, this, uh, this this micro microorganisms, of course, without uh, interfering with the with the with the normal micro microbiome. Uh, my question, therefore, would be that uh, uh, what what would be the feasibility of this approach? Of course, we have to look at some of the uh, other things, other factors like uh, the economic potential and uh, the economic ramifications vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis such production methods, which would seem very, very, uh, very expensive because these drugs are supposed to, to reach everyone. And uh, antimicrobial resistance has been shown to be very, very um, rampant, especially in people, the social, a lower socioeconomic class. That would also spill over to a misfit Zablon. Uh, in your presentation, I've seen um, uh, when we are functionalizing nanoparticles to be able to uh, to be able to uh, to be used against or to target a particular pathogen, uh, then uh, proper and the wide uh, molecular background of this uh, this particular pathogen is very important. Uh, meaning that uh, we need a we need a proper genetic background, molecular background, and need to customize this um, this uh, uh, this kind of uh, therapeutic interventions to be able to 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 to, to get uh, to get to the direction towards physician medicine. Um, what would be uh, your input in this? in terms of, of course, producing something that is very efficient, but also something that can be economically viable. Something that, uh, yeah, yeah, something like that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Baraka. So let me first uh, maybe give chance to a uh, prof to answer the first question. I hope, Prof, I hope you got the right question, the, question, no, the, the first question was, right. There was a lot of feedback, but I think I got what he meant. It's more about feasibility and um, ability to get this to everybody. Well, as I said, these are new frontiers uh, um, in, in development. Um, a few compounds in preclinical trials, animal studies, some in clinical trials at the moment from the studies that I have looked at. But um, well, and all these are happening in uh, more advanced and developed countries. I'm just going to stay positive because um, of course, I know they have started pharmacogenomics uh, where you have to do individualization of care study in the individual's genetic makeup and see if they will respond to the a particular drug etc. If they have started doing those, uh, well, I'll stay positive that this can also um, go far. But as I said, probably it will take some time to for this to trickle down um, to, to us or our part of the world. But uh, we just have to stay positive and, and keep following some of the studies and outcomes of the clinical trials. Uh, that is science. You just have to try and see that what, what will come out of it. So that's what I'll say for now. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for, for answering that question. And I hope, Baraka, you got the uh, answer right. So, okay, maybe, yeah, now, uh, Zablon, uh, if you got the second question right, currently you can answer it. Over to you, Faith. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Favor, for that question. So for, I think I got two questions out of what you were asking. So when it comes to functionalization of um, materials, of course, you need to have an understanding of what you're working with. And we are looking at bacteria and in bacteria, we have proteins, we have nucleic acid. So sequencing is very fundamental. So um, you need to understand the sequence of the proteins that you're targeting or the nucleic acids that you're targeting. Because let's take in case you're functionalizing a gold nanoparticle with an antibody to attack 
a specific protein in the bacteria, then you need to understand the sequence of that bacteria or, you know, uh, the reverse uh, the reverse amino acid sequence of that protein so that you can be able to target it. Otherwise, we do have like a universal proteins that we can target on bacteria like the oligopolysaccharides that are very common when you're looking at at like high priority bacteria like E. coli. So all uh, polysaccharides uh, on Pseudomonas, on E. coli, on Klebsiella are commonly targeted when you're functionalizing nanomaterials and you know trying to um, prove the concept that nanomaterials can actually work as antimicrobials. So it is very fundamental to us to understand the sequences of the RNAs or the DNAs or the proteins that we want to target. And then um, the other thing that you are asking is about the cost-effective uh, approaches to these nanomaterials. So there is one that I didn't mention because I said that nanomaterials are very wide. So we have nanocomposites. So nanocomposites basically are a type of nanomaterials that are quite commonly available, like copper. So you you copper and the use of polymers like polyethyl glycol is very common because they are quite affordable. So you basically conjugate copper with a polyethyl glycol and functionalize it with an antibody or a protein, then you can target it. So the most cheap material that we have so far in nanomaterials is copper plus um, some polymers like polyethyl glycol. Um, but like I said, this is a research, you know, it's a research field and we still have several steps that we have to move. But the fact that we are having these conversations means that we are ready to embrace the fact that research is expensive, but even translating this research to applicability is expensive. And I would also like to add on the precision aspect of um, what Dr. Cynthia was saying. Precision medicine is something that we talk about in every disease. So understanding the genome of the bacteria, understanding the genome of the human is very crucial to us so that when we come to targeted therapy, we need to know an individual's genome and the genome of the bacteria that we're targeting. So um, materials can be modified to what you're targeting, but fundamentally you need to understand the molecular aspects of the bacteria and the human uh, cells. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zabdon, for that uh, great and wide answer. Yeah, and uh, I do hope, uh, uh, Baraka, you got all the answers right. Okay, thank you so much. So yeah, I can also see Daniel comment saying, yeah, I think as technology develops, democratization will eventually happen. And uh, however, to accelerate the process, technology transfer and capacity building will help too. Yes, and uh, I do agree with him because yeah, technology transfer, it's one of the important uh, aspect or approach that could be used uh, to accelerate the process because uh, we see that uh, maybe not uh, actually, uh, many people are aware of this and uh, actually this could really help as far as uh, yeah, capacity building is concerned. Okay, uh, thank you so much. So, uh -huh. I don't think we have uh, any additional question uh, from the audience. I just would like to uh, ask you one final question, and that's uh, this goes to uh, Faith. That is, how do we ensure the safety of uh, nanoparticles uh, before now we go into uh, use, maybe as del to deliver the medicines or uh, uh, to be used as uh, yeah in treatment? How do we first ensure the safety of the nanoparticles? Over to you, Faith. Okay, yeah, thank you. That is a very interesting question. It's a question that we ask all our professors, like how do we ensure that? So this is a whole other field of research because there are people actually working on understanding the cytotoxicity of nanomaterials and how we can be able to reduce cytotoxicity. However, the human system is a very complex system. So some materials, depending on the size and their concentrations, they can be eliminated naturally with our kidneys. And so advantages of using the likes of liposomes is because they are hydrophilic. Uh, so that means they can be absorbed in the body and they can be eliminated naturally through the you know, urine, uh, through the kidneys and the urine. However, 
like I've said, this is a whole new and research area, but you know, uh, some are already in the market and they seem to have some level of effectivity, um, but it is an, a, an area of development. But lipo, polysaccharides and the use of nanocomposites like um, uh, hydrogels, it's very common as they, because hydrogels are very effective in integrating the biofilms because I, I know of research going on in our lab of using hydrogels to reduce the formation of film by uh, candida, candida aureus. So hydrogels are also very good because they can, uh, they're hydrophilic, they can be eliminated from the body. So liposomes and hydro, um, hydrogels are very effective, but other materials, this is just a whole new, a, a whole research area that people are working on. So it is a work in progress. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, do Blue kindly, uh, you can kindly uh, ask your question uh, because I think I cannot trace your question. Kindly ask it. Or do Blue, if you can hear me, uh, the floor is yours. Or do Blue, please, can you hear? I think Dr. Cynthia has shared it below and it says, as I mentioned in the challenges, poly infections will have to be looked into to understand microbiota dynamics of all the microbes causing the infection. So it is an oil, sorry. Uh -huh. Okay. I think the question is there, Dr. Cynthia just posted it. Yeah, sure, I can now see, yeah, sure. So I can see here another question uh, coming from Habia Remy uh, is asking, I would like to know whether it is possible to have both slides presentation. If yes, yeah, how can I, yeah, sure. We are going to share the slides uh, immediately after here. And uh, we have a WhatsApp group. Uh, so currently, if you're not in that WhatsApp group, uh, Maybe you can kindly uh, reach out to us through our email address, which I'm going to share it here below. I'll be able to share with you uh, the slides uh, if you're not in the WhatsApp group. Thank you so much. And I uh, also would like to share with you uh, a link uh, to the American uh, Microbiological Society that a professor recommended that uh, we join, and uh, I think your yeah, prophet shared that link uh, above. So currently, maybe after this, uh, we can explore what uh, activities are being undertaken there. And uh, uh, also it is important that we all join uh, that group. Thank you so much. So to this far, I don't think uh, we have uh, additional questions or comments if now, uh, because actually time is going on. And uh, before we end the session, I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Daniel, if you have any comment to make, you can ask kindly and quickly say something yeah, before we end the session. Daniel, if you can hear me, you can say something, please. Yeah. Hello, hello, Jimmy. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much uh, to our great presenters today, Professor uh, Prof. Cynthia and Afid. We really do appreciate a lot of learning, a lot of learning. On my end, I've really learned a lot, and I'm sure that we'll invite you once again. My name is Daniel Arwenge. I'm the head of programs at Students Against Global Africa, and we are really privileged and uh, really humbled to have your presence today. And uh, we really thank you thank you the great education that you had, uh, Faith, uh, you know, uh, preparing the slides in a plane. I'm sure I can't read how, uh, quite tasking and even after the plane you are here presenting take it for granted and we really uh thank you so much uh professor faith and uh, professor cindy and uh, faith thank you so much i wish you a wonderful time wonderful afternoon professor faith uh, a wonderful day uh a faith and wonderful afternoon uh professor cindy and uh, a wonderful time to all of us who join the session. Thank you so 
much for joining us in today's session. And I'm sure we'll have more as we go on. Thank you, Jimmy, over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Daniel. And uh, yeah, I'd like to uh, sincerely thank uh, Sabron for making this session. Uh, the timing has really was not so convenient on her side, and I just would like to appreciate her so much for actually dedicating and committing her time to present and share uh, a word with us. Thank you so much, Faith. Also, Prof, really appreciate uh, your acceptance and to honor uh, our invitation to present to us. And uh, also appreciate everyone who made to attend this uh, workshop today. Uh, I do hope that uh, we are going to, uh, oh, we have learned something and we are going to incorporate in our respective areas of research interest as far as uh, antimicrobial research. I think we lost Jimmy. Hello, Jimmy. Uh, so it's, I think we lost Jimmy for a while. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining and uh, yeah, thank you so much and do have a wonderful time ahead. And we'll share the presentation and the and the recording. We'll share the recording with our, uh, with our speakers too and all of you. Thank you so much and do have a wonderful time. Thank you. In case you are not in the group, uh, I'll just share the, the link for joining our group uh, so you can just join in uh, for the students. Thank you. So I've just shared it there. Uh, you can join in via that. Okay, bye bye, everyone.